in front of projector. It's blindingly bright. On top of box. <laughs> Let's break some shit. You ready to go? We're live? All right. Well, good evening, everyone. So. You all know the man standing next to me, of course. He's our famous friend, Bruce Potter, the British feminist philosopher and bioethicist. He is the director of the Center for Bioethics and Philosophy of Medicine at University College London. He's the author of several books, papers, and articles, and has sat on a variety of advisory and working committees in areas of philosophy and bioethics. At present, his name often arises in articles and discussions on organ transplantation, in particular, the idea of a legitimate organ trade. Ladies and gentlemen, Bruce Potter. Thank you. That is exactly what you get when you um, don't send in a um, bio to Nomicon. So they just make it up. Anyway, um, this is Living with Game Servers. Uh, it's not necessarily a security talk, but there may be some security oriented stuff. Um, anyway. Perfect. There you go. Uh, <laughs> So for those that don't know me, um, I'm Bruce Potter. I'm, I'm not a bioethicist. I believe that uh, biology is evil, so there's really no point in being an ethicist regarding it. Um, stem cells are good. Okay. Um, I do a lot of security stuff, but I also play a lot of games. Um, I got into security because I enjoyed it and I was spending all my time doing that. Um, it turns out now that I do security professionally, I spend all my time gaming. Um, so I figure I'm going to start talking about gaming now because <laughs> that's all I do anyway. Um, and eventually I'll probably get paid to do this and then I'll pick another hobby and go off and do that instead. Um, gaming is big. Like it is really, really... A, what? I, it's freaking bright up here, man. Like Ted brings these, like the surface of the sun lights from California. You know, he harnesses all the power out there. And so it's just, it's blinding. Solar power, it is absolutely, and actually they're like environmentally friendly ones on the top that we appear not to be using that are like LED lights. Um, but, you know, down with the earth. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's fantastic. Like I'm on the beach, you guys are not. Um, anyway, <laughs> console gaming is big, $27 billion. If you're wondering why I wrote USD in front of them, it's because the Team Fortress 2 font actually doesn't have a dollar sign. Um, it was a little wrench, and so I had to actually write USD in front of them. In Team Fortress 2, yes, there is a font that you can go grab right out of the thing and use for your whatever you want, your resume. It's impressive. Um, <laughs> uh, PC gaming, you know, th these are huge numbers. These are billions. They're not trillions. They're not bailout size, but they're fucking big anyway. And, you know, it, it, we, we don't necessarily... Um, treat gaming as a real, you know, discipline. You know, we talk about it like, man, it's cool, I frag some shit. Or if you play on Xbox, it's 14-year-old boys who like to use the word dick every other word um, because it's the first time they learn to swear and they have an audience. Um, but it, it, there's big money, and they spend a lot of money to, to build these games. They spend a lot of money playing them every year. And we spend a god-awful amount of time playing these games. So, you know, it's time that we kind of have some discourse about it. Um, how big is big? Rampage. So... <laughs> Um, you know, this is Steam, uh, 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 which is online content distribution and game management and that kind of thing. Uh, you know, this is the active number of Steam users online at any given moment. You know, 1.7 million users on Steam at, at its peak on an average weekday. Uh, you know, World of Warcraft, same type of numbers. One million, one and a half million, two million people at any given moment playing World of Warcraft. That's a large percentage of the population. You know, that's a, that's a big chunk. Um, Monster kill, kill, yeah. kill. There's going to be a lot of those. <laughs> Anyone know where those are from? Unreal. Unreal, yeah. You know what game sucks? Unreal tournament. Uh, ooh, yeah, let's start it. Because you know that Windows versus Linux is old school, so let's talk about like Unreal tournament versus anything that doesn't suck. Uh, <laughs> I want to play Unreal like really bad. I bought UT3 and I played it and it was unenjoyable. The whole, anyone ever see that Penny Arcade um, thing where uh, I think Gabe is playing Unreal and he's like talking to people and like friending them and shit. He doesn't realize he's playing against bots. Yeah. Right? Because Unreal, or, like other multiplayer games, you just have bots running around and that speak to you and be like, hey fucker, I just owned you. It's not a real person swearing at you. Um, I, I, I fell into that trap. Like I'm not... <laughs> I'm not too big of a man to admit that, uh, you know, I was playing Unreal 3, and I'm like, wow, these people are all kind of cordial, but they all suck, and it turns out I was playing against easy bots. So, um, anyway, there are a lot of um, 
sites that focus on reviews of gameplays or in industry analysis, who bought who, which of the hundred you know publishers went out of business last week, um, you know reviewing gaming hardware, my my NVIDIA cards better than your ATI. How many ATI people in the audience? Yeah, I got a 4870. It is the shit, and I paid about $100 less than the new NVIDIA guys did. So um, there aren't a lot of public discussions about security. If you talk to server admins, it's, shh, don't, don't talk about security publicly. We don't want to give away things to those hackers, because the hackers are getting all their security information from the admin mailing list, not the uberelite.de domain gaming sites where you can download all the hacks. No, 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 they're waiting around for the admins to say something stupid. Um, there are a few public discussions regarding kind of the impact of the underlying technology. Jason Scott talked about that a little bit yesterday. If you, if you have a chance and you read, um, go read Racing the Beam. It's a fantastic book. Um, it's like one of the first non-manual-esque books I've read in a, long, in a long time. It's really pretty good. Um, and we're beginning to kind of discuss the culture behind gaming and how it's impacted us as a society beyond violence. Like we've had that discussion, right? Jack Thompson's been disbarred. You know, there is... <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, he doesn't get a hold of this because I'm sure he'd sue me just for mentioning it. Um, you know, but there's 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 been the violence conversation, but now there's other com you know you know education. How does it you know just you know, reflect how we interact as a society? You know, and, and how does it affect our children and how they communicate and things of that nature? Um, anyway, what we're going to talk about today impressive. Is, thank you. Um, is uh, game servers. There's really two types. We're going to focus on the latter. Um, the first is these provider game servers. You know, when you play WoW, you're not playing on your friend Billy's WoW server. Uh, you know, right? You're playing on Blizzard's WoW server. There's no confusion about it. You pay them a bunch of goddamn money, and they let you play and get addicted. Um, so, and their support groups and all that kind of shit. Um, but. And if you play on a console, pretty much all console gaming, when you play multiplayer online, you're, you're playing on you know, Sony's or Microsoft's or somebody's servers that are supporting that game. Um, with PCs, you know, there's this idea of community-driven game servers where I can go download a publicly available, at least binary, maybe not the source code, publicly available server, I can install it, I can run it, I can name it Billy Joe Bob Jed's, you know, whatever server, people can join it, I can form a little community around it, we can sing Kumbaya and blow each other up and it's fantastic. Um, so it's kind of like open source software in some regards, right? Why would you do that? Well, one, it's convenient to run your own servers. You can put your own maps on it. You do whatever the hell you want with it. Um, you know, you get famous. Some of these clans, some of these organizations are big. Hundreds of people. And, you know, they think they're all hard and cool. And they go to conferences and wear black t-shirts and smell bad. And it turns out it's a lot like us, you know? <laughs> Same reasons that you get involved in security, you know, in these security conferences, is it's a community. And for the gaming side of things, and the PC gaming um, especially, it's very much a community. There's not really a community on console gaming, because every people that plays console games are asshats and dicks. Uh, <laughs> ooh. <laughs> wow. I don't have a very high opinion of online console gaming, if you hadn't. It's true. I heard someone say that. I heard that. It's true. Killing spree. So every time. It's going to get old, and then it'll get funny again. It's kind of like Family Guy. He's, ooh, you know, it's going to be like that. Um, so, <laughs> so who's running these servers? Um, you know, you've got individuals, you've got clans. This is the No Moose Gaming Clan. Woohoo! Represent No Moose. I think there's one other No Moose member in the audience. Um, teams and league, you can play amateur, semi-pro, professional league play for gaming, you can make money playing video games if you're really good, and it's amazing. Like, I, I started out um, going into an amateur league, I started playing Cal uh, with a, a group in my old clan, and I swear to God, we practiced every night. Like an hour, two hours a night on a server, scrimmaging, practicing strategies and the maps that we're gonna play the next day. It was hard, like I gave up. Like after two weeks, I'm like, man, I, I did not have the time for this kind of thing. And these guys have been doing it for six months. They just uh, placed third overall in, in, uh, in TWL, um, and they got beat pretty bad in Cal. But the guys are playing, these guys are good. Like I play a lot of Team Fortress 2. I mean, there's no confusion. 150 hours as Demo Man, I mean, that's the number of hours on one class that I've played. That's a lot of time, a lot of seat time on a game. And I go on some of these servers, and these guys kick my ass. You know, and so these guys run their own servers, they practice, they do their own thing. Um, some of them they own and run in a data center, you know, go to Dell, buy yourself a 1U server, rack it, stack it, get yourself a connection, maintain it yourself. Um, that's what we do with ours. Um, you can buy slots from a game service provider. You know, I want to play Counter-Strike. 
So, and I want a 48 port, you know, 48 slot Counter Strike server. It's 50 cents a port per month. You write them a check for $24 a month, and they give you a server, and you can control it and do whatever the hell you want with it. Um, there are lots of people that try to run them at home, you know, because they're like 16 year old kids, and their mom bought, bought them a really big PC, and they decided, hey, I'm going to load up my box and put Team Fortress on it and whatever. Um, and it, some of them actually do a decent job running on residential lines. Some of them never figure out how to do it right. The performance sucks. And then their mom turns off the light switch, and the power goes out. And, and Unstoppable. Start all over again. Um, so what games are people playing? How many people play Call of Duty and that? Yeah. yeah. Half-Life and HL2 Deathmatch. Are you a Deathmatch person? Any, you guys play Deathmatch? You do the bunny hop thing where you like run around and skip and go sideways and makes you go faster. Like Half-Life 2 Deathmatch is this really weird like yoga-esque game where like if you just walk in and use like WASD and like walk up to people and try to shoot them, they will like pummel you and then teabag your corpse. It's really, or Congress. It kind of depends. Um, but there's all these little tricks you can do to like scoot around and make yourself go faster, and you have to practice it, and it's, it's insanity. Um, but that's actually based on the newer Source engine, not the original Half-Life engine, the Half-Life 2 Deathmatch. Uh, Battlefield, Battlefield 2 is actually a lot of fun. There's Unreal Tournament, there's Quake. People are still playing like, you know, Quake 3 Arena. They're playing all kinds of crap. Um, so there's a lot of different games people are playing. Um, Holy shit, shit, so, shit, shit. <laughs> That's one of my favorites. Um, we're going to talk about SRCDS, the source dedicated server, uh, for a variety of reasons. It, it, Counter Strike, uh, how many people play Counter Strike here? Yeah. Terrorists win. Um, they always do. Um, so uh, Counter-Strike was basically a game that, you know, some, I'm bastardizing the story, but basically some guy in a dorm room took the original Half-Life engine, modified it into a terrorist, counter-terrorist game where the terrorists have hostages, the counter-terrorists have to rescue them, and then released it. And he would release all these little upgrades and have people help him play and help him play. And it became ungodly popular. It was like a brand new video game that this guy made based on Valve's engine. Not any of Valve's models or gameplay mechanics or anything like that. They just took this rendering and kind of engine that, you know, that handles all the vector math about where everyone's going and how to play online, and they just made a game out of it. And it was obscenely popular, um, and it continued, um, has continued to, to be so to this day. Um, Valve then upgraded their engine to what's called the Source Engine, kind of overhauled all the internals, but it's still unbelievably customizable. If you want to make yourself a video game, and it's not like a casual video game, but you want to do like a first person shooter or some kind of interactive puzzle thing, um, you know, the Source Engine is there for you to tear apart, put back together, do anything you want with it. It's fantastic. And Valve makes it available totally for free, do anything you want with. Um, it, it's really interesting. Um, there's a huge number of servers deployed. You know, 10,000 Counter-Strike Source servers, um, which is, is according to the Game Tracker number two, uh, game that they track as far as server uh, uh, number of servers go. Number one is the original Counter Strike. Still to this day, It'd be like a hundred thousand people playing Counter Strike at any given moment. Most of them in like Estonia and Latvia and you know whatever that one that was on that Onion ad yesterday, Spamia or whatever it was. Course Forgoff. Thank you. <laughs> a lot of people have seen that one. Uh, <laughs> Um, you know, but, but seriously, that's, um, it's pretty amazing that Counter-Strike, the original Counter-Strike, which is now a seven, eight-year-old game, has had that kind of longevity and still has that many people playing it. Um, but anyway, so we're going to focus on, on the source server. I think it provides a lot of examples of what's going on in the game server administration community um, and some of the challenges that these game servers have to deal with. Combo whore. So, um, so what's the big challenge for a gaming engine? Well, the big challenge for the gaming engine is not a LAN party, right? Like you're all not sitting in the same room on a 100 meg switch network with like basically deterministic latency. Um, you know, people are sitting all over the planet, some people with big, huge, fat pipes, some people with little, tiny pipes, and it has to provide a reasonable gaming experience for all of them, okay? It's not a console. You know, these people don't have the same hardware. You don't know how fast they're going to render. You don't know how shitty their box is. It, it, you just, you have to be able to accept that you're going to have everybody from, you know, a single core, you know, Athlon, whatever, um, to all the way up to somebody with an i7 and a bunch of extra crap bolted onto the side of it. So um, the, the, the big challenge is then when these people are interacting with each other, you want a seamless experience that's fair. Right? You don't want to punish the people that have fast connections, you don't want to punish the people that have slow connections, but you also want to keep them engaged in the game. Um, and it turns out that this is actually a really complicated problem. Holy shit! Yeah, so... <laughs> 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 
it's just, I, I can just flip the slides. If, if no one actually wants to listen to me talk, I can just do that, because they get funnier, really. Uh, so, um, you know, what do they have to do? One, they have to provide real-time services on an operating system that isn't a real-time operating system. Real-time operating system means something specific, right? It acts in a deterministic fashion. Things happen in a specific amount of time, okay? It doesn't just mean that it's fast. It means that it does something very predictably. It can be a slow RTOS, but it's an RTOS because it goes. And you can get RTOS patches for Linux and turn it into a real-time operating system. And it's kind of a pain in the ass, but um, you know, it actually really does help with these game servers. But by and large, you know, people that are running the game servers on Windows or running on most versions of Linux, it's not an RTOS, but you need that kind of deterministic capability in order to properly get all the information to the clients. Uh, you need to enforce a very complex mathematical model of where everything in the level is. Every wall, every person, every bullet, every health pack, every whatever the hell it is, needs to be accounted for, you know, a hundred times a second, every second, all the time on these ginormous maps, right? And every one of these things can have a velocity, it's got a vector associated with it, it's going in some direction, and I have to keep track of all that information. Um, I have to potentially distribute content to clients. Okay, the source engine allows for dynamic and custom creation of content, so um, I create a map, I put it on the server, you don't have the map and you try to play, well, I need to provide you that map. And so the source engine will be able to distribute maps and sounds and models and things to you dynamically over the network. So if you want to go play uh, zombie, what the hell is it, zombie something source, there's like a zombie hack for uh, the source engine and go play a zombie game that's not Left 4 Dead. Um, and you just go download it and it just downloads all the stuff you need and you're up and running. Um, you got to control cheating. You got to try to prevent people from cheating, detect cheaters, give people a means to, to handle cheaters, um, spectate the matches. So at ShmooCon, we had a Team Fortress 2 tournament, and um, one of the big things we did was write a custom scoreboard for the tournament, which was um, flash-based, and there was a lot of floating little bubbles that showed the score of the match and who had killed who, how many times, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but there was also a window that was like watching a television uh, screen of the game. And we could control it from another PC and control the camera and follow around, like see a pack of people come running through and we come swooping behind them with a the camera and everything. And you know, it was actually kind of interesting because it was totally like trying to turn these video games into spectator sports. Um, and you can go online if you're into such things. You can actually watch like some of the big uh, uh, tournaments and leagues when their final matches. They'll have guys like John Madden rolls up and he'd be, you know, what you need to do to kill someone is shoot them in the head until they're dead. And <laughs> John Madden was the king of obvious. I'm going to miss him so much. Um, I really will. I think he was a good, he was a good color guy. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, you can, you can do this now. You, it, they have this native hook into it, and they even provide a mechanism to scale that, so you can have hundreds of people, thousands of people watching it, um, and they provide a, you know, a mechanism to proxy to other broadcast systems and that kind of thing. Uh, remote administration is something that's in there, and highly extensible. That's something Val's been doing for a long time, is providing this extensibility. Um, it's pretty amazing that they distribute all this for free. That you can download this for free. But on the flip side, it's in their best interest. Right, because the, the more and cooler the engine is, the more they give it away, the more people are going to go buy the game and play it with their friends and whatever. It, it is the crack that keeps everything together. You know, you give this away for free, let people self-form communities, and they will go and buy your game in mass and make you very rich. And Valve, Valve's not stupid; they figured this out. Headshot. So, what makes TF2 so popular? No one even laughed at that one. Um, what makes TF2 so popular? I, and, and I don't mean to harp on TF2, but I, I play a lot of it, and I think um, it's useful to think about why one video game does well and others fail. Okay, and there's clearly issue with gameplay mechanics being shitty and bugs and things like that. Um, but there's this kind of idea that you need to be able to describe a game in a way that someone gets it very quickly, right? I don't want to read a 28-page manual to understand how to play the game. You know, maybe to learn a move here and there, but I want to be able to just look at it and go, oh, I understand, right? Pong had eight words on the front of it, right? It said, avoid missing ball for high score and insert coin. And, and you know, as, as, as pretty obvious as it was on the screen, you know, the words to back it up were equally as obvious. Okay, I get it. And Pong was engaging. There were other games that preceded Pong that people had played in other uh, uh, types of situations in labs and, you know, kind of these precursors of the arcade and that kind of thing that actually were more complicated than Pong. Okay? But people couldn't figure out all the little rules and didn't really understand what they were supposed to do. 
And Pong succeeded in a lot of reasons because it was so goddamn simple, and it rewarded people. Like, if I, you know, hit the ball more times than you did, I scored better than you, and then I won, right? Um, Team Fortress 2 is, is, in some regards, the same type of thing. You know, if you're red, you kill the blue team. <laughs> If you're blue, you're killed or red. If they don't look like you, blow them the hell up. Okay, it's really not that complicated. Sometimes there's little issues, like there might be some intel you have to carry around, or a cart that you have to push, or some shit like that. But if you're pushing the cart and someone of the other team is nearby, what do you do? You kill them, right? It's not complicated. <laughs> you know, there's some mechanics of how to, how to actually do the killing, but in general, it's a very simple premise. Um, and there are people that really fall into that because, well, holy cow, like that's, that makes a lot of sense. It's very easy. Um, another thing about TF2 that I find really interesting is the attention to detail and art direction. Um, these slides will be available on my site later, so you, know, you don't have to copy this ridiculously long URL down. There's actually a website that's like the antithesis of tiny URL. I can't remember the name of it, but it's like goddamn huge URL. Um, and like you send it like Amazon.com, and it'll spew back a 2,000 character URL that you can send to people so it doesn't fucking fit in Twitter. <laughs> oh, let's start the Twitter bashing along with the uh, Unreal Tournament bashing. There'll be at least one person here that really hates me at the end. Anyway, this presentation, what they do is they talk about the, um, the mathematic behind the, the shader models and the lighting models and the color models and how what was available to them at the time when they started doing Team Fortress didn't work for the kind of 50s style cartoony thing. Um, they talk about how all the different players have different silhouettes so you can recognize them at distance and you can recognize the colors easily because most of what you're going to see on a person is in the torso area, so most of the color involved for a character is going to be in that area, so I could see them at the horizon, recognize that's a you know, demo man, and he's not my color, he's blue and I'm red, and I can see him at a great distance. And they go through all these kind of th the thought process that it took, and it's actually remarkable how much effort it took to go through this. So um, I'm gonna show you... Um, oh, it gets sick! So, <laughs> Heidi did those for me. Um, <laughs> um, Anyone got a room I can sleep in tonight? Uh, so, so this is the meet the, not Al's room. Um, this, this is the meet the sniper video for those of you that's seen it. Um, you know, this, this kind of speaks to some of the um, art direction and the character development that they did. Like they actually developed the characters and kind of gave them their own personality and they, this kind of comes through in the game. How many people play TF2 just before I get too far? About half, that's not bad, and a third. Um, so for the folks that haven't, there's multiple classes. There's nine classes um, that all have different capabilities. Some of them blow things up, some of them you know, are very fast, some of them uh, can cloak and change into other characters. This one's a sniper, it's fairly self-esteem. Whoops, I hit the wrong thing. Oh, it gets sick! <laughs> Thanks, appreciate that. Oops, there we go. Oh, for fuck's sake. Okay, I'll move the mouse. <laughs> Hit shot. Sniper did a good job, mate. It's challenging work, out of doors. I guarantee you'll not go hungry, because at the end of the day, long as there's two people left on the planet, someone is going to want someone dead. Ah! 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 Oh. Yeah, get yeah, armor. Yeah. Not a crazed gunman, Dad. I'm an assassin. Well, the difference being one is a job and the other's mental sickness. I'll be honest with you. My parents do not care for it. I think his mate saw me. Yes, yes, he did. So here's his urine that he's saving because he can't go to the bathroom when he's waiting to snipe the guy. Feelings. Look, mate, you know, there's a lot of feelings. Blokes were bludging their wife to death with a golf trophy. Professionals have standards. Be polite. Be efficient. Have a plan to kill everyone you meet. First blood. So they go through, and every character is like this, and they've gone through all this kind of you know, development about it. And, and I think you know, that's really made the game appealing. It's really made it visceral. It's really made something like, at the end of the day, you get home from work, and you're a little pissed off, and you want to let off some steam. There's nothing like setting people on fire, so you be a pyro. 
you know, if you're really mellow and you're kind of baked and you just want to, you know, chill, you get a sniper and you just aim for people's heads. Kapow, kapow. You just watch them explode. It's really great. So whatever mood you're in, there's a class to match your mood. Um, so one thing I want to talk about with the servers is frames per second. Um, you know, we're all familiar with the bigger your uh, frames per second is, the better you are in bed. Um, <laughs> all the ATI users say, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we got bigger ones. Um, so. <laughs> um, basically, the server needs to render frames just like um, the client does, except it doesn't create a screen buffer that gets displayed to the screen, but it still needs to know where everybody is. So periodically, um, the server takes all the information it's received from all the clients and it renders a frame. Um, it doesn't render it graphically, it just renders it in memory and it, it knows this is where everyone is and that's kind of the ground truth at that microsecond in time. Um, the server you know, unlike your, uh, your workstation, when you render something on your screen, your workstation is doing all kinds of optimization. Like, it doesn't render the entire goddamn world and then cut a little section out of it and display it, right? It doesn't even render the shit behind the person that it's showing, right? If there's a rock, it only renders the front of the rock. Like, it, you know, as much as it, it cares that there's a backside uh, to the rock, it doesn't show it to you visually. Um, the server cares about that. It doesn't show it visually, but it has to care about every nook and cranny, every part of the goddamn uh, environment. Um, the server's view is the, the ground truth, but ground truth changes over time based on information that comes in from the client. I'll show an example of that in a minute. Um, Servers are configured for a specific frame rate. Most people don't configure their clients for a specific frame rate, right? You just let it run as hard as humanly possible and suck down all the energy you can, um, unless you run with vSync on. How many people run vSync when they do, when they run gaming? Right. So um, you're familiar with that? You're familiar with the idea with, uh, um, you know, the way the video card works is it takes something, uh, you know, the, the snapshot in time that it needs to display, and it figures out how to display it, where all the colors go, how all the pixels are going to be set, and it sends that information to the frame buffer and it gets displayed on the screen. If it's um, got information before the screen's done showing one frame, like if your monitor's updating at 60 hertz, it gets another frame and it's done, it's just going to send it to the goddamn monitor. Right? And you'll, your monitor will actually, you'll see these little glitches that look like the screen's been torn and you have a slightly offset image part way down where it flickers every once in a while. That's called screen tearing. It actually is your video card kind of going really fast and faster than your monitor can take it. And sometimes it gets all out of whack and you get these little foop that, it, it's not a black spot, it's just where the two images didn't align anymore. And if you spin around a lot, you can usually see it. VSync is a way of saying, look, I'm just, whatever the hell your monitor is set to, 60 hertz, 70 hertz, 100 hertz, that's all I'm going to build. I'm only going to build you that many frames a second, and I'm to, every time that monitor tries to refresh that, I'm just going to send that to your screen. Okay? So one, it keeps your video card in check and doesn't push it all the way all the time, but two, it also tends to look better because you don't get all these weird artifacts that are a function of screen tearing. I recommend, I mean, go home and try it. Like, set your screen to 60 hertz, turn on VSync. Um, if your box can't handle it, it's going to suck, but if the box can handle it, your games are going to look a lot better than they do now. Um, servers are a lot like setting VSync. You set a specific frame rate that you want them to render because, again, this is getting back to that RTOS idea. They want to deterministically be going through time and every you know, 66 times a second, boop, 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 I want to render that real world view so I can send it back out to the clients. I just want to go, you know, come and go as I please. I want to set a specific rate and run with it. Um, in, in SRCDS, that's called a tick. How many frames per second? It's called a tick rate. So if you read documentation later, um, that'll help you understand. Dominating! Yes, I know. Thank you. Um, so. One of the complaints that you'll hear when you're a server admin, and my god, you hear a lot of complaints, whiny bastards that have nothing better to do than bitch about the free thing that they're playing on. Um, one of the big complaints is um, the performance and its impact on gameplay. Right? Like you're kind of familiar with the idea of a laggy server where it just doesn't feel right. Like, you know, everything's kind of er herky jerky and you're not getting all the data and, you know, things aren't working right. But there's kind of a more subtle idea of hit registration. So hit registration is I'm the sniper and I've got my, you know, sights leveled on some guy, and I pull the trigger, and he doesn't die, right? And it's not that I didn't hit him in the right spot or something. I mean, I just whiffed him, like completely whiffed him, because he moved out of the way, even though I know damn well that I pulled the trigger and hit him when the reticle was on his head. Um, well, it's a complex topic, and I'm going to try to um, try to distill it a little bit here for you. Rampage. Thank you. Um, so here, 
it's kind of hard to see, but here I've got a, um, a sniper up on top, and he sees a soldier. It's apparently like eight pixels at this resolution. Um, and down here, here's a soldier, and he sees a sniper. Okay? And they're going to make the fight or flight you know, decision right now. Where we're going to duke this out, or am I going to get the hell out of Dodge? The sniper's like, I'm going to shoot this guy in the head. The soldier says, screw this, I'm going to run. So um, over here, we've got you know, the server time, which is effectively ground truth. So t equals zero, they, they, they make their decisions. Um, so then what happens? The sniper zooms in, he sees the soldier, he's got a bead on his head, and the soldier turns left and starts to run the hell out of there, right? Um, so at this point, t equals one, you've got um, you know, uh, um, the soldier making his decision and the sniper making his decision. So some time passes, and the um, sniper uh, system sends a packet to the server, right? and the soldier's uh, system sends a packet to the server. Well, the sniper's got lower latency. The sniper's packet gets to the server first, and as far as the server's concerned at that time, that's a hit, right? Because nobody's told me otherwise. I haven't got any information that I'm moving. I haven't, I haven't heard squat from anybody else. So meanwhile, you know, this is kind of measured in milliseconds, but the sniper's waiting to see what happens. The soldier's waiting to start to run, and now we reach a point at which Okay, so finally, the server's now recognized it's a hit. It's sent that updated worldview. It's gotten to that next tick and sent that updated worldview to both the sniper and the soldier. Well, finally, the soldier's run packet got to the server. Well, while that was happening, the, um, the soldier actually thought, hey, his system hadn't gotten the update yet that something had happened. So he's still running. And as far as he's concerned, he's, his, his, his client has actually started to allow him to run a little bit. So he's mo made it a few steps at this point. And he's behind the rock that you saw originally. And the sniper's box gets this update. Kapow! And soldier's head explodes and, you know, yeehaw, victory. And the soldier's starting to think, hey, I made it. And next thing you know, headshot. He doesn't. He's laying on the ground, looking up at the sniper. This is actually his rendered hand. Um, so, so he's been shot in the head. Um, and that'll happen when you're playing these games. When you think you got away, like, oh, you shot me behind the wall. Um, well, it, no, actually what happened was it took a little bit for the server to, you know, kind of decompose what was going on. And your client kind of allowed you to do some more stuff. And it started to render you sideways. And, and then you got the message, oh, I'm sorry, you're dead. And you fell over dead. Um, you know, you can change this. Holy shit. So that, you know, if the sniper gets more lag, um, then exactly the opposite thing happens. You know, the sniper's miss a shot, and the soldier gets away. So that's kind of a very simplistic way to think about, you know, every one of these tick marks, the server's computing the entire worldview, and they're constantly getting these updates on environment from all the clients, and the server has to make these decisions about, you know, what's going to happen, um, and, and who's going to kill who, and all that kind of thing. Um, bottom feeder. Bottom feeder. That was for you, Al. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Oh. <laughs> um, so it's an even more complex topic than that, unfortunately, um, because the clients can change how fast they send and receive data. Some may have slower and faster connections. And the server actually tries to obey what the client's worldview was at the time. Okay, so the client may, um, you know, it, it's a little bit more complex than that situation that I gave. Um, kind of as an example, I was playing against a sniper on a map who had a very slow connection and was not receiving many updates from the server. Okay, So it's, his world was very herky-jerky and it was delayed, but the server tried to obey the updates that it would get from him 300 milliseconds late, a third of a second, which is actually an appreciable amount of time in a game that's usually handled in you know, units of milliseconds. Um, and this dude kicked everybody's ass because the server was trying to give him a better experience. What he was really doing was cheating, right? He manipulated his rates, he manipulated what he told the server he can take, and he added, added latency into his system, and this guy is basically untouchable because he jumps around all the time, and the server is allowing him to make these shots. And so when I would spectate him, like I swear to God, because I'm getting the updates faster than him, you could spectate other players, so you just see through their eyes to see what they see. Like, you'd be looking down the barrel of his gun, you'd see someone run away, and then a half a second later, the person would rematerialize and explode right in the middle of the reticle. And then he would aim somewhere else, and the same thing would happen. It was like these bodies would just like teleport back and forth in time and blow apart into little pieces. You're like, holy shit, that's a neat trick. Yeah. 
And we all had to gang up, so we all turned into spies and sneak up on him and stab him in the back, which he wasn't good enough to get out of that. But um, anyway, so, so the server has to make these decisions, and unfortunately, um, you know, they, they, they sometimes make decisions that aren't in the best interest of the 20-odd other players on the map when there's one guy on there who's got a very bad connection or is purposely manipulating his rates. So um, uh, a lot of the server... Uh, the servers can self-regulate that, though, and you can set minimum and maximums. The server I was on Rampage. did not, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> just keep giggling. It just it never see. I, I was actually in my room practicing this earlier. I just went through all the slides because if you go through really quick, here I'll do this. It. Humiliation. Unstoppable. Humiliation. There we go. <laughs> they all layer on top. It's very. It's very satisfying. I'm sure the other room just loves me for this. <laughs> that jackass. Um, okay, I don't have a lot of time left, so I'm just going to hammer through this. Uh, capacity planning, uh, basically, you, the faster the box, the better. Your friend is affinity, processor affinity or task set if you're on Linux. You can say, this process lives on this uh, core. Do that. Right? Because otherwise, it, you know, it's expensive to move a process from one core to another. These game servers are usually not multi-threaded enough to run across multiple cores. Because they already have big concurrency problems with accepting all the stuff from all these different sources. If you have to take that con concurrency issue and split that across multiple cores, it becomes very difficult to manage. Um, and so they all tend to run on one core. So you just want as fast as humanly possible cores and as many cores as you can. And then you can layer a bunch of servers on. Because from a bandwidth perspective, you know, a TF2 box running 24 slots at full throttle will take up maybe two megabits of bandwidth, but it'll take up a full 2.4 gigahertz Optron or Xeon core, um, just full throttle. So um, in general, the, um, I think I said this somewhere, um, Intel is better than AMD. I don't know why. Um, excuse me. You can buy these Optron servers really cheap from Dell uh, right now or any time, really. The Xenon boxes, honestly, are much faster than the Optron boxes. Um, Humiliation. And, and of course, with any game service provider, you know, like an ISP or whatever, they oversubscribe. So, you know, just because someone's bought, you know, four 24-slot uh, TF2 servers doesn't mean they dedicate one four-core box to it, right? They may have 20 24-slot TF2 servers running on one system and just waiting for someone to bitch about, hey, there's a lot of lag, and that's because the processes are running so slow because there's so many uh, um, things on there. So you got to watch out. These game servers are just out to make a buck. Probably the cheaper the, they're charging, the shittier the performance is going to be. So you kind of get what you pay for when it comes to uh, uh, buying uh, services from uh, game service providers. Um, Remote administration, the one thing about remote administration, you can remotely control the ser servers, change the level, you know, ban people, do whatever the hell you want to. Um, there's this idea of Archon, which is a remote console. Um, the kicker with giving out Archon access to your friends and buddies is it's giving them the ability to exec and save files um, as the running user of TF2 on that host. It's like giving them a Unix shell, but it's prettier because it's rendered in 3D. Um, it's like everyone always wanted. Wasn't that what Enlightenment wanted? You remember the old Enlightenment window manager? Like they wanted, you? yeah, woo, yeah. Because you needed like 16 megs of RAM to run Enlightenment, and most people only had four, and like their ultimate goal was like a big spinny Steve Jobs desktop. Um, but anyway, the one thing you got to watch out for for Archon is that it, it will allow you to run processes and save files as a user. So you'll sometimes see things like, hey, you want to run SRCDS on Linux? Just run it as root so you get past all the file permission problems. It's a really shitty idea. Like, I mean, it's generally a shitty idea to run things as root that listen to the network anyway, but it's a fantastically shitty idea because it's basically just a wide open pipe for people to fuck your box. Um, Unstoppable. Just like Al. So, um, <laughs> there's all kinds of plugins. This isn't the interesting part. The interesting part is really dominating. The cheating. Um, Cheating comes in many shapes and sizes. Unfortunately, there's a lot of them that are built in. With, uh, you know, Jason made this uh, point the other day. When you make things extensible, you open the door for people to be jerks and to cheat and do things that you didn't intend them to do. Um, you know, we're going to show a couple here where um, you know, some of these cheats are basically you know, simple replacements um, of files on the, on the um, client system, and some of them are a little bit more complicated. So, oh, I get sick! <laughs> God damn. <laughs> 
So um, what you're going to see here is, um, this is a pyro, that's his fire gun, and if you listen very carefully, you're going to hear two noises, and one is a spy cloaking, and one is a spy uncloaking. They're very faint noises, they're the stock noises that you hear when you play Team Fortress 2, and then this guy will probably meet a very... Impressive. Thank you. Oh, I get sick! Sorry, I hit the wrong button, but god damn, is that funny. Okay, listen. So that was a spy cloak. <laughs> and that was the uncloak. There was a real subtle whoosh. And that spy was directly behind that pyro when he uncloaked. Okay? So the game will give you little subtle cues like that, that there's someone behind you. Normally there's a battle raging. And so the little whoosh is totally overblown by the fact that people's body parts are flying all around around you, and there's people, weapons and all kinds of stuff going. So what you can do is you can actually change the spy uncloak sound. Um, so here's an example uh, of something that gets your attention a little bit more effectively than the whoosh. Um, this takes a little bit more to develop. I was setting these up. So I'm going to back up here and kind of wiggle into the spy. Maybe a little butt waggle there just for the camera. There we go. So there's the cloak. Here comes the uncloak. I'm the scat man! <laughs> So that's really simple, right? It's just a wave file that you put on your file system, and now you're a scat man. And whenever you hear scat man, just start blowing shit up behind you because there's a spy. And I was playing the other day, and I heard the song, and I was like grooving out, and I got stabbed in the back. I'm like, I need to pick a more obnoxious sound because I was just kind of like, yeah. Rampage. So here's a, what's known as a wall hack. A wall hack is basically um, um, I'm changing the character models so that they render through everything. Right? It doesn't matter how far away they are or if there's, say, I don't know, a wall or a rock between us. I know where everyone in the level is. I have cool music. This is stolen from YouTube. But like that guy's around a corner. You can't see the original, you know, model or the, the textures on him anymore. But you can recognize like that's still a heavy. You can still see these body types. That was a demo. And this guy sees everyone running. And up here in a second, like he, his own team is blue. He can see all the red team, other places. Turns the corner. There's a red guy. And then they slow it down here. All these people are in a hallway, and he can see where they all are. Okay. This would definitely be viewed by some as cheating, right? <laughs> like looking through walls and that kind of thing. Again, this is all just client-side replacement of models, right? I can download the SDK, I can make my own models, I create a little file, I load it in, um, and, and I put it there so now I can see through, see through the walls. Um, you can get a little more advanced here where... Um, combo whore. We're going to see a combo whore here. Um, this is a sniper with a name bot that automatically gets some headshots. Oh, fucking bastards. Got some aim there. So, like, you pick the dude out of the air in the head. I mean, this is just... And all these boxes are, you know, indicators of who's, who it is on the other team and all this information. And this thing just automatically, as soon as it gets within the box, you see the little jiggle? That was the aim bot automatically, like, keeping track of his head. So this is client-side code that's um, basically hooked directly into the game and is controlling um, the player's movements on the player's behalf when they're trying to get shots. Um, so you saw the wiggle where it kept track. This next video is actually kind of interesting because other weapons have a big spread associated with them, but the client knows the spread ahead of time, and so you can actually adjust the angle of the shot to compensate. Well, there's a heavy weapons guy that shoots a chain gun. Right, and he shoots like 10 rounds a second, and they all have a spread. So in order to compensate with an aimbot, he just dances around like he's having a seizure, aiming at the thing that he's trying to hit. And so, um, double kill. He 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 does do, indeed that. Here, I'll move that out of the way for you. Um, they even have like a nice. This is a very calming kind of video. They, um, <laughs> private hacks. If you're going to sell hacking, you know, stuff for games, you've got to have a professional image. So they've got a very, very nice thing here. Oh yeah, you can you buy, oh, you buy hacks. And it's whether or not it's been detected by Steam yet, and that's how valuable they are, and all kinds of things. And so he's shaking around like that, because he's got a scatter gun that shoots in all kinds of different directions, and so that thing's constantly just trying to keep 
on track. And so there are these bounded 3D boxes around all the enemies, and the heavy's kind of twitching around, and all this stuff's going on. And this is just all client-side attacks, right? So, um, you know, you get the basic idea. Dominating! How, how do you stop this? Um, you know, Valve implemented this thing, this variable called svpure. Um, by default, svpure is zero. It means I don't really care what you're running. svpure equal to one is I'm not going to allow you to have any new sounds, models, uh, materials, and that kind of thing, all the basics that run the game. And the way that I'm going to try to enforce that is through CRC32 checks. Okay, so it's good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it prevents the, the, the ankle biters from just copying and replacing the file, um, but it's not that hard to find a collision, quote unquote, I don't even know if you want to call it that, in CRC32, right? It's really not complicated to make a WAV file that matches whatever CRC32 um, that you want it to match. Um, SV Pure 1 will prevent you uh, from doing that by scanning the file system um, and looking for things that don't match the Steam distributed content. SVPure 2, there's no custom content, no sprays, nothing like that. And that takes a long time, because that scans the entire game and verifies the game was running exactly as it's supposed to as far as it can tell. Okay, so game startup already takes a long time. Like on a reasonable box, game startup can take, you know, a, a minute or something like that. This, this really increases the time it takes to join a level. Um, Killing spree. Uh, patch management. I'm getting close on time here. So um, the Valve releases patches automatically. The great thing is they tend to release them at 4 o'clock on a Thursday. I don't know. <laughs> I guess just going home for a long weekend. Um, and they tend to break shit a lot. So there's usually cleanup where some random really poor Valve employee is releasing patches on Sunday night because all the game server admins are bitching because their game doesn't work. Um, different games get broken in different ways. But the one thing that seems to be very... Um, constant is the game's bloat. They require more hardware on the server side over time as they release more and more about uh, um, these games. It's been true for Valve games, Unreal Tournament, Call of Duty 4. It takes more horsepower over the years to run them because they're constantly integrating in all these new features and changes. Perfect. Um, thank you. Finally, um, game server culture. Uh, this is interesting. Game servers, uh, the admins that run these things, have to deal with Cheaters, whiners, griefers, asshats, racists, a lot of racists. Jeez, I don't know what the hell it is about online gaming that brings out racists, but God. Um, but cheating, seriously. Or planes. Or planes, yes, or if you're Al, planes apparently bring them out. Um, but uh, admins, you know, dealing with cheating is tough because if you have a bunch of cheaters on, your, on your, your server and people are used to playing in a relatively nice, polite environment and then they start losing all the time because people are cheating, they don't want to come back. And so you have to be able to control these people, control them quickly, ban them, keep them off your server, have a way of sharing information about them and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, there are a lot of tools, a lot of community that's built up around this. And what ends up happening is um, it's kind of like old school IRC. Remember, like, you gave opera status to your friends to kind of keep the channel clean when you weren't around? Same thing. Right? They have administrative plugins that you just go in and assign admin rights to various people so they can kick and or ban different players and that kind of thing. And, and these communities really are what keep these servers going. It's the fact that multiple people are going to pony up and they're going to try to keep these servers clean. So uh, anyway, in a nutshell, um, humiliation. Yeah, I am really humiliated after this. Um, that was a lot to cover. Uh, you know, my, my point with this whole thing is that you know, when you play these online games and you're engaged in them, there's an awful lot going on behind the scenes, from the technology to the culture to the, the business mechanics and the cheating and all kinds of stuff. Um, and it, I find it fantastically interesting, and there's not a great body of knowledge out there when it comes to this. I'm going to try to present uh, much more detailed information on the security of this uh, of, uh, game cheating at uh, Black Hat this year in Vegas. Uh, but even other aspects of this, the, the, uh, the business side of it and whatever else, there's not a lot of public knowledge out there. So if you get into this, if you are a game server admin now, or you decide to get into it, hey, just stand up a wiki and post your thoughts, post what you've learned, try to share information, because it's amazing to me how many times I see people joining these administra uh, the administrative mailing list and just basically saying that asking the same questions have been asked a thousand times before, not because they couldn't search for it, but because there's really no good way except for like mailing list archives and a few other things for them to pick this stuff up. So, um, you know, please, by all means, contribute back to the community, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's no time for questions, so if you need to find me, I'll be out drinking a beer. Thank you very much.